Welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. I'm Rachel Kinderdine, Community Manager. Tonight, we join Dan Schnur for the January Dan Schnur Political Report. Dan's topic tonight is the long road to November primary season begins. Sorry about that, had a couple of tabs open. For those of you who would like to submit questions for Dan, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen where you can type in your questions. I'll be managing your questions during the Q&A segment, which should start in about 30 minutes. We're really excited to try out a new format tonight. In the second half of the program, when we go to our audience Q&A, we'll welcome two of our members, Anita Rodal and Robert Aronoff, to ask their audience questions on screen. We're very excited to have them with us and to interact directly with the topic and the program. So we'll wanna hear additional questions from our audience in the future. If that's something that interests you, uh, definitely keep that in mind. So tonight, Dan will start by talking about the Republican primary, move into Biden's challenges preparing for the election, and then he'll talk about the general election. So Dan, I will turn it over to you, and we're really looking forward to it. Well, Rachel, thank you so much. It's great to see you. And I'm really excited to be with all of you tonight, kicking off our 2024 programming. It's hard to believe, but for those of you who've been with us since the beginning, we've been doing this. We've been doing this webinar first weekly and more recently monthly ever since the beginning of the pandemic. So we've been doing this for almost exactly four years now, which of course is a presidential cycle, a term of office and election. So we're going to talk about the election, of course, not just tonight, but through the calendar year 2024. And tonight, as Rachel said, we're going to come at it from three different angles. Uh, first, we're going to start talking about the Republican primary, but because it's top of the news, the Iowa caucuses, as all of you know, are taking place next Monday night, followed by the New Hampshire primary a week later, and only then do the Democrats uh, begin to engage with their primary schedule. But after we talk about the Republicans tonight, we're probably going to spend less time talking about the Democratic primary, per se, um, although if once we get to questions in the second half of our program, You'd like to discuss Dean Phillips or Marianne Williamson, the other Democratic candidates on the ballot. But what we think, what Rachel and Katie and I have talked about, is once we've talked about the Republican primary between uh, Trump and Nikki Haley, Ron DeSantis, and Vivek Ramaswamy, now that the former New Jersey governor, Chris Christie, has uh, stepped out of the race, we're going to talk less about the competition within the Democratic primary, because clearly there isn't much of one. Rather, we're going to talk about how Joe Biden is preparing for re-election. So we will talk Republicans and Democrats just in a slightly different context. And as Rachel said, we'll wrap up the first portion of this program by talking just a little bit about the general election. Then I'm very excited by this new format. And just like we've added questions from Rachel and Katie in the first half hour in the past, Having World Affairs Council town hall members asking questions, not just by writing them in, but on screen, we think will add a whole new dynamic to this conversation. And if you have a question for a future webinar that you'd like to pose on screen as we're presenting, let us know and we'll do our best to make room for you going forward. But let's get started and let's talk about the Republican primary. Because while Donald Trump, of course, enjoys an immense lead in the polls in Iowa, New Hampshire, and nationally. I would say that while Trump's nomination is very, very likely at this point, that it's still not definite. And that Haley, in particular, has now climbed to within a single digit margin of Trump in New Hampshire. And if she were able to win the New Hampshire primary, Trump still because still remains a strong favorite for the Republican nomination going forward. But it's still entirely possible that this could can turn into a competition for the nomination. Uh, Haley and DeSantis debated last night, uh, as most of you know or read, and for those of you who didn't watch it, I will tell you, not taking sides, either between them or between one party or the other, you didn't miss Mary very much. And what was most interesting about the debate is it reflected the last couple of weeks on the campaign trail that even though Trump is such an immense front runner at this point, 
Haley and DeSantis have been concentrating most of their attacks, not on the front runner, not on Trump, but on each other. And what that means, whether in the debate or on the campaign trail, is that although they're not going to say it out loud, both Haley and DeSantis know that they're not going to beat Trump in Iowa. But what both of them needs very, very badly in order to continue as even a potentially viable candidate is they need a second place finish. If Haley were to finish second, that would be the end of the Ron DeSantis's campaign. And it's worth reminding ourselves that at the beginning of 2023, DeSantis looked like a very strong challenger to Trump. And many of the national polls showed them running pretty close to even among Republican primary voters. Now, that was a long time ago, and DeSantis is really flailing at this point. And if he's not able to finish a strong second next Monday night, that probably is the end of his campaign. Um, if DeSantis is to finish, does finish second, then that creates a couple of problems for Haley. One, it would almost certainly lead to a loss of momentum for her candidacy going into the state of New Hampshire, uh, having finished in Iowa worse than, uh, than many had expected. But it also means that rather than having a one-on-one -on -one contest against Trump in New Hampshire and going forward, which of course is what Haley wants, if DeSantis does finish ahead of her in Iowa next Monday, then he almost certainly does stay in the race. And then you continue to see the non-Trump vote split between multiple candidates. And for those of you with good memories, and I know from my experience with all of you that that's most of you, if you think back to the 2016 Republican primary, when Trump originally became the party's nominee, this is how he did it, by dividing his opposition. For most of the primary schedule, Trump in 2016 was not drawing a majority of the Republican primary vote. In other words, there were a lot more Republican primary voters who did not want Donald Trump to be the nominee than did. But because those votes were split between so many other candidates, between Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio and others, Trump was able to finish first in most of those primaries, not by getting a majority, but by those who opposed his candidacy. Uh, not uniting behind a single candidate. And if Haley is not able to finish uh, a strong second next Monday night in the Iowa caucuses, it's more likely than not that we'll see that dynamic continue in this year's in this year's primary. So if we know that barring just a monumental upset, if we know that Trump is very, very likely to win the caucuses on Monday night, I would still say that even though that's the very probable outcome, it is still wa worth watching the results and I'll tell you why. Because I wanna get back to that majority point that I made a moment ago. Trump winning a lot of primaries in 2016 and perhaps this year, not with the majority of the primary vote, but with the plurality because of his, his opponents split their votes. So what you wanna be watching on Monday night as the results come in from the Iowa caucuses and caucuses, as you know, aren't nearly as straightforward a selection process is primary. So it might take a while and it could be Tuesday or later of next week before we know the final results of the caucuses. But you want to be watching for, what you want to be watching for as those results come in on Monday night and in the following days. One, of course, you want to be watching to see who finishes second. Because if DeSantis pulls out of second place, then the anti-Trump field remains splintered. If Haley is able to beat DeSantis, and polls out of Iowa just today show her now running somewhat ahead of him there, then you may see that anti-Trump vote consolidate behind her. So that's one thing to watch is who finishes second. The other thing to watch is what percentage of the caucus votes Donald Trump gets. Because even though what the expectations, as I've mentioned before, are that he's going to win by a very large margin, we don't know how large that margin is. And I would say this, that if Trump gets more than 50% of the vote in Iowa next Monday, then that's going to be judged as a very strong victory for him. And regardless of whether DeSantis or Haley or both continue, it becomes much, much more difficult for either one of them to beat him going forward. If Trump gets more than 50% vote, if he gets a majority out of Iowa, then his front runner status becomes solidified and perhaps even inevitable. But... If Haley, and, if Haley and DeSantis are able to keep Trump below that 50% threshold, even though Trump will obviously still remain the front runner, that suggests a level of vulnerability. 
and means that while he attracted more support than any other candidate, he didn't necessarily enjoy majority support in a state like Iowa. And it's worth remembering that Iowa, unlike New Hampshire and some other early primary states, Iowa is a very rural state. The Republican voters in particular in Iowa tend to be extremely religious voters. And these are the voters who've been the core of Trump's support since 2015 in 2016. So if Trump does not receive more than 50% of the vote here, it does suggest at least some potential vulnerability going forward. So what I wanna do uh, before we go any further is I'd like Rachel and Katie to put our first question on the screen for all of you. Given what I just said about what to look for next week, and as we go forward, we'll talk about the other primaries. Here's our first question for you. Not who do you want, not who do you prefer, but who do you think, who do you predict will be the Republican nominee for president by the time this is all said and done and the Republicans gather in, uh, in the state of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, this summer for their convention? Who will be the nominee? Will it be Trump? Will it be Haley? Will it be Ron DeSantis? Will it be Vivek Ramaswamy who's still in the race? Or will it be somebody else? And let's see what the answer is we get on that and then we'll go forward. Okay, this is, I know from experience that this is not a Trump crowd in terms of preference, but in terms of prediction, 81%, more than four out of five of our group believes that Trump will be the nominee. And I have to say, Haley getting 18% of that vote um, actually might be somewhat encouraging to her because if she does need to finish second next Monday, we see that only two of our attendees uh, predicted that Ron DeSantis would be the nominee. So Trump's a strong favorite, but uh, but Haley showing some strength also. Very, very interesting. Okay, so let's keep going on. Um, Rachel, I know you had a, a, a question you wanted to raise before we went on to the Democrats. Yeah, so you mentioned uh, the um, the debate last night and then the town hall also with Donald Trump. So did the debate and the town hall do anything to change the primary campaign? Like, really good question. And in fact, thank you for the reminder. Because, of course, as we know, Donald Trump has not participated in any of the Republican primary debates to, to date. And given past primary history among both Republican and Democratic primary candidates, what we've seen in past years is candidates, particularly front runners who don't participate in the debates, tend to be damaged politically by their refusal to engage. And that hasn't happened with Trump. There were four debates that took place in the fall of 2023. He didn't do any of them. Last night, of course, was the uh, first, the last debate before the Iowa caucuses. And instead of participating in the debate with Haley and DeSantis, he did his own town hall meeting over on Fox News. And the general consensus from people who watch these things is that Donald Trump won last night. The fact that he's able to command an audience on his own without facing opponents and not suffer any political consequences. The fact that Haley and DeSantis did not spend most of their time aiming their criticisms at Trump, but rather at each other, that means he emerged fairly unscathed. The other thing that was interesting though about the town hall last night, and so I am glad that you raised it, Rachel, is if you listen to Trump up until now, the message he's been articulating has been one designed to motivate his strongest supporters. Trump's been talking to his base from the very beginning on immigration-related issues, on abortion-related issues. He's not reaching out, has not been reaching out to the political center in the slightest. What he's been trying to do is get conservative Republicans as fervent in their support from as possible. Last night, in a number of different ways, the message we, we, we heard from Trump was not a Republican primary debate message. It was not a message devoted or targeted toward the most conservative voters. Trump began last night articulating a general election message. And on several occasions, even while keeping a very hard line on issues like immigration and crime, you could tell that he had been told, and he followed that guidance, that he needed to begin reaching out 
to swing voters who he'll need to win away from Joe Biden in a general election. So what we saw last night from Trump was a tremendous amount of confidence that if the primary isn't officially over, he still thinks it's time to start getting ready for a general election. So you touched on this when you were doing your opening, but what should we be looking for next week as we move into the Iowa caucuses and the following week for the New Hampshire primary? Oh, you're, you're right. I did talk briefly about what to look for in Iowa. And that is, number one, who finishes second to Trump, uh, whether that's Haley or DeSantis, and what that means for the race going forward. But second, the threshold of the vote that Trump receives. And just get a little bit more specific about it. If Trump gets more than 50% of the vote, he'll be judged as the big winner. If he gets, I'd say, between the mid-40s, 44 45% and 50 then he'll be judged as a winner of the debate and still be going on in New Hampshire in a very strengthened position. But if Trump's support is in the low 40s, 40, 41, 42%, then he's going to look, even though he's going to be the front runner, he'll be judged as a weakened front runner. And perhaps DeSantis, more likely Haley, emerges as a stronger challenger. What's important to keep in mind, and I alluded to this briefly, but I want to take it further, is how different Republican primary electorates are in Iowa and New Hampshire. Iowa is a very rural state. It's a very religious state, particularly among Republican primary voters. The Iowa Republican Party is a Trump party. New Hampshire, on the other hand, think of much of New Hampshire as a really big suburb of Boston. New Hampshire Republicans uh, tend to be more secular. They tend to be wealthier. They tend to have college degrees. And we know that Trump does strongest among those voters who do not have college diplomas. So it's a really stark difference between the electorates. Iowa was made for Donald Trump. New Hampshire was made for Nikki Haley. And if either one of them doesn't win the state that was made for them, then that demonstrates a tremendous weakness for their campaigns going forward. After New Hampshire, the next primary uh, for the Republicans is the state of South Carolina, where Haley served for several years as governor. And again, although it is a real long shot and our audience is I think, wise enough to make Trump the strong favorite, the Haley best case scenario is even a narrow second place finish in Iowa over DeSantis, a DeSantis withdrawal from the race. Haley either winning New Hampshire or losing it to Trump very, very narrowly, and then winning her home state of South Carolina in the primary season continuing. If any one of those three things does not happen, if she doesn't finish second next week, if she doesn't win the New Hampshire primary or finish an excruciatingly close second, or if she doesn't win South Carolina, then it's over. She needs three in a row for this race to even continue, and even at that point, she's still an underdog. But there's not a lot of margin for their margin for error for their a lot of margin for error for her at all. So, Rachel, what do you say? Um, because, of course, we want to talk about all sorts of things also, both you and me, but also with our guests and with our with our group. What do you say we move on to the Democratic Party? Yeah, like that sounds... oh, go ahead. Okay. And like I said earlier, on the Democratic side, even though there are technically primary campaigns taking place starting in South Carolina, next month, given that well, the Democrats have changed their primary schedule since 2020. Uh, Biden's real competition are not the other candidates running for president as Democrats. Biden's big challenge is going to be motivating his party's most loyal supporters. Biden has to motivate his base, young people, voters from minority communities, other progressives, these are people who would not vote for Donald Trump in a general election if you put a gun to their head and a knife to their throat. But what Biden and his campaign are worried about justifiably is that many of those voters might simply not turn out at all. And if those progressives, if that Democratic base is not motivated for Biden in November, then that's a recipe for a Trump victory and a Biden defeat. So what you'll see Biden doing while Trump is attempting to secure the Republican nomination you're going to see Biden doing everything he possibly can to convince 
those core democratic voters, the young people, the voters from minority communities, the other progressives, that he's worthy of their, so not just their support, but their enthusiastic support. And it is going to be a big challenge for him. And how could that constituency impact the, the campaign and then the ultimate outcome of the election? Yeah. Well, Biden understands that when he won the party nomination back in 2020, it was not because of a huge amount of enthusiasm for Biden's candidacy, but because a lot of these voters, a lot of these progressive voters and young people and minority community members, they voted for Biden rather than for Sanders or for Warren, not because they preferred Biden, not because their hearts were with Biden, but because they thought that Biden was better positioned to beat Trump. It was a very calculated vote. So these are voters who've never been all that excited about Biden. And what he and his campaign are trying to do is find ways to talk to them to get them more motivated. So for example, Biden gave a really big speech in South Carolina, the site of the first Democratic primary earlier this week, in which he talked about race relations as an issue specifically designed to motivate voters from these communities. Um, you're going to see him talking a lot during the primary season about climate-related issues. And you're going to see him, as he did in his first campaign speech of the year last Friday in Philadelphia, you're going to hear him most frequently talking not about specific matters of public policy, but talking about saving and preserving democracy. Because he knows that those progressive Democrats, while they might not love Joe Biden, they hate Donald Trump. And by talking about saving and protecting democracy, he's reminding the Democratic base that they don't have to be excited about him as long as they're excited about Trump, albeit in a negative rather than a positive way. What do you think, uh, Rachel, what do you think we bring our, uh, our group back in to the conversation? Should we go to our next poll question? Pretty straightforward. And you guys have already heard my opinion on this, but let's see if you agree or, or disagree. Who do you think will be the Democratic nominee for president, Biden or somebody else? I'm guessing we're going to get a pretty lopsided set of responses. What do you think, Rachel? Okay, well, let's see when we have it. Ninety-two percent. Actually, the eight percent who think that someone else will be the Democratic nominee for president, that's a little bit higher than I would have predicted. I guess the other question to consider, though, and if we could ask that 8%, I would want to ask them, as I'd want to ask the rest of our audience, the question that many Democrats are asking themselves, even while Biden is trying to enthuse and excite the base, is they're asking him, is Biden, is Biden the best potential Democratic nominee for president? Not will he be the nominee, but should he be? And you hear people in the party talking about whether Vice President Harris, whether our governor here in California, Governor Newsom, Governor Whitmer from Michigan, Governor Shapiro from Pennsylvania, Senator Warner from Georgia. There's a lot of fairly impressive Democrats around the country, primary voters believe. And we're hearing more and more conversation about whether them would be better positioned to run against Trump in a general election. Biden doesn't think so. The majority of Democrats don't think so. They think Biden is the best nominee. But the more longer that conversation continues, the more damaging it is for Biden. Because the more loyal Democrats are talking about whether this should be someone else as the nominee instead of him, that's a very significant obstacle to him uh, exciting and motivating the base in the way we were talking about a moment ago. But let me, I'll say, I'll say this, Rachel, because that was such an easy question, we got 92% saying Biden. Let's give them what might be a, a tougher question. Now we're gonna ask you, we're gonna to switch to the general election for a couple minutes. And we're gonna ask you not who you want to be elected president, not if you would prefer Biden or Trump or someone else, but if we can put that third question up on the screen, we're gonna ask you not who you want to be elected, but who do you think will be elected president in November? Will it be Trump? Will it be Biden? Or will it be someone else?
Oh, interesting. 69% say Biden. That's two thirds of our group. But that's actually, I don't know about you, Rachel, that's a lower number than I would have expected. 24% about a quarter think Trump is going to win. And 7% think there'll be somebody else. And I'd, I'd love to get a, have the chance to ask them who they think will win instead of one of those two. Maybe it's one of those, it's, it's some of those 20% of the people who thought Haley would be the, the Republican nominee. Um, the last thing we want to talk about briefly, and we'll spend more time talking about the general election in the question segment for the second half of our program, is here's what I'd like all of you to think about before we get to our, our question section. Um, in the general election, we've talked about Trump, we've talked about Biden, but I want to talk about for just a moment are the issues that I believe are going to shape the 2024 campaign. And in particular, there are four issues that I think are going to uh, determine who wins the election in November. The first issue is immigration. And right now we're seeing Biden uh, getting pressure, not just from Republicans, but from an increasing number of Democrats. For an increasing number of Democrats to think that the, uh, the Biden administration needs to do something more forceful at the border. And when you see a party, it's a general rule of politics, when you see a party divided over an issue, that generally means that it's an issue that helps the other side. Because if one party can't really decide where they want to be on it, it's harder for them to move on it forcefully. So right now, I'd say immigration is an issue that works very strongly in favor of Republicans. If immigration policy works very strongly as an issue in favor of Republican candidates, then I'd argue equally strongly that abortion policy, abortion rights, is an issue that dramatically demo uh, benefits Democratic candidates from Joe Biden on down. And not only in the Q&A in the second half of tonight's program, but going forward, we're going to talk a lot more, not only about how Democrats highlight the abortion issue in a way that was very effective for them in last year's midterm elections, and even in some special elections in 2023, but just like the Democrats can't quite figure out how to talk about immigration policy, the Republicans are divided in how to talk about abortion and how stringent to be in the way they articulate their opposition uh, to, oh, to reproductive rights. So that's an issue that works for the Democrats. Um, we'll talk at much greater length later today and in the future about the impact of the economy on the election which right now, even though right now it's an issue that appears to be helping Republicans, I suspect by next year we'll see a jump ball on that issue in which neither party has a definitive advantage. Today's inflation numbers notwithstanding, we're generally seeing an economy that's trending in the right direction. And while I don't think by November voters will be enthusiastic about Biden's handling of the economy, I do think that's an issue that's going to settle out as pretty much an even split between the two sides. And then, particularly for those of you who've been longtime members of World Affairs Council who care deeply about foreign policy and international relations, I would argue to you that while it's very rare that foreign policy impacts an American election when America itself is not at war, I would say given the tremendous stakes in Ukraine, in the Middle East, and now in China, and let's not forget that Taiwan is having its presidential election this Saturday, it appears, at least according to public opinion polling, that foreign policy is likely to play more, have more of an impact on this year's elections than has been the case during a peacetime election in many, many years. And then, of course, as I mentioned earlier, Biden's strategy, in addition to talking about these particular issues, is to talk more broadly about democracy, both the threat that he believes that Donald Trump represents to our democracy and what he will do to protect it. So before we bring on our two guests, let's ask uh, our group one more polling question. And we've asked this periodically throughout the year. I'm eager to see if your opinions have changed. The question is, is of the five issues we've just talked about, which one, somewhat of an unfair question, which one do you think will be most likely to decide this year's presidential election? Will it be the economy? Will it be foreign policy? Will it be immigration? Will it be abortion? Or will it be that broader topic of democracy? 
Now we recognize there's plenty of other issues that voters think about and that we all think about. And if the issue that you think is gonna impact the election most isn't on that list, well, then we apologize for not having the room to include it. But on these five, let's see what our group thinks are gonna have the greatest impact. Wow, our group is all over the map. Look at that. Uh, there's a tie between the economy and that democracy discussion, 27%, absolutely identical numbers, a little bit over a quarter for both of those topics. Only 6%, even given what I said about Ukraine and uh, the Middle East and China, only 6% say foreign policy, but immigration and abortion, issues which as we established earlier, clearly cut in one direction or the other, immigration in the Republicans' favor, abortion in the Democrats' favor. That's almost exactly even too. 20% say immigration will help decide this election more. 19% say abortion. So I don't know about you, Rachel, but I can't remember the last time we asked our group a question on which there was such a strong uh, divisions of opinion. Interesting, huh? Yeah, I don't think so either. I think that uh, typically there's a pretty clear winner and this is almost an even split. I'm really impressed. Look, and we haven't even talked about Donald Trump's court cases. We haven't yeah. even talked about Joe Biden's impeachment and Hunter Biden's legal challenges. So all sorts of other atmospherics surrounding this election that are almost certainly going to have an effect. And I guess we'll have to get to those in future months. But what do you say we uh, we go on and we try out our new segment? You ready? Yeah, I'm very excited. Um, and yeah, definitely so much to get to moving forward. Um, but we wanted to first start, as we mentioned um, at the beginning, we'll have some members join us. This idea has been in the works for some time, so I'm really excited to actually have um, members on screen and interacting. Um, we first started by extending invites to some of our most active participants in our monthly members only after the webinar roundtable. Um, so our first guest is Anita Rodal. She's been attending dance programs since June of 2020. Uh, she's the president of SBPI Services, and yeah, she's been um, a part of our Members Only Roundtable for as long as I've been here. So, Anita, if you want to go ahead with your question. Thanks. Hey, Anita. Dan, I know that this is water under the bridge, but I'm curious to know, to what extent do you think Chris Christie's stance on not pardoning Donald Trump affected his standing in the GOP polls and why he didn't gain more traction in general among Republicans? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a really good question, Anita, and I don't think it's past tense at all. Because while Christie himself, of course, withdrew from the campaign yesterday, he represents a segment of voters um, who are very strongly opposed to Trump being the party nominee. And what's interesting about Christie's approach is unlike candidates like most notably like Nikki Haley, but others as well, who criticized Trump, but were somewhat careful in not criticizing him too harshly, given the amount of loyalty Trump still enjoys among Republican Party voters, is Christie was much more frontal and much more aggressive about it. And so it became clear very quickly that he was not going to be the, the, the he was, had no chance of being the Republican nominee for president. And even though he wouldn't admit it out loud, it was pretty clear that Christie knew he wouldn't be the nominee. And his job, his primary goal in the campaign was not to be the Republican nominee for president, but rather to prevent Donald Trump from being that nominee. And so what we're going to see now going forward is that even though in many states he didn't have a great deal of support, he was actually doing pretty well in a state like New Hampshire, which, as we talked about earlier, is a much different type of Republican voter than we see in Iowa. And so by getting out of the race, uh, just... You know, a week and a half before the New Hampshire primary, Christie, although he has said some critical things about Haley, it appears to me that he's trying to do everything he can to help her at Trump's expense, not because he likes Nikki Haley, but because he really believes it's important to stop Donald Trump. And while that's not a majority opinion in the Republican Party, it could add some necessary support to Haley's candidacy going into New Hampshire. Uh, so... Christie's campaign is over, but the sentiment it represents, while it's not a majority or even a plurality in the Republican Party, could be determinative 
in a close primary in New Hampshire between Haley and Trump. So we'll see what happens. We don't know if Christie is going to endorse between now and the New Hampshire primary a week from Tuesday. We don't know what else he's going to say or do in public, but I do know this, that anything that Chris Christie says about the primary and about Trump or Haley or the other candidates is going to get more attention now that he's not a candidate than it would have when he was a candidate. So he might actually have enhanced his platform by withdrawing when he did rather than diminishing it. And I will take this uh, uh, opportunity, uh, Nita, before we go on to our next question, just to thank you because you've been such a loyal participant in our program for such a long time. And for those who participate in the uh, in the program we do after the webinar uh, with our, you know, with our with our members, Anita every month has really smart and interesting questions. Uh, we love having you involved, and for the rest of you who participate in those programs, um, we're very grateful to you for being here also. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. And now I'd like to welcome Robert Aronoff to join us. He's a lawyer and director for Teach Democracy. Robert is also a very loyal um, participant in our After the Webinar Roundtable, and he's been joining Dan's program since 2020. So Robert, do you want to take it away? Sure. Um, I wanted to ask you, I watched the uh, both the debate and the town hall last night. And in the town hall, um, uh, President Trump was asked if he was going to select a uh, vice presidential candidate. He seemed to indicate that he already had one in mind, although he did say that now that uh, Christie had dropped out, he liked him a little bit better, <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was funny. But um, what do you think about the vice presidential candidate for the Repub for Trump if he gets elected or nominated, and how will that affect the election? A couple of things struck me, Robert, and it's it's a, it's a really smart insight because it was a moment that passed fairly quickly during the town hall. It didn't get a lot of attention at the time, but it's a question that carries a lot of import for obvious reasons. But I'd offer you a couple of thoughts. One, I don't think Donald Trump knows who his running mate is going to be. I think the reason he asserted it last night is he is trying to make it clear that he is already the nominee of the Republican Party. And he wants to start running a general election campaign right away. So by expressing so much confidence that he can have already picked a running mate, that's his way of saying to Republican primary voters, don't waste your time or your vote with DeSantis or Ramaswamy or Haley. I got this wrapped up. And what was interesting is after the debate, the speed with which his advisors made it clear that in fact, Trump had not picked a running mate that he had misunderstood the question and had not meant to be quite so determinative about it. But the reason I think it's such an important question is not just the histrionics from last night, is think back to his selection. Think back to Trump's selection of Mike Pence back in 2016. Back in 2016, Trump's advisors believed that he needed a candidate, a running mate, who could give him credibility number one, with the Republican establishment, and number two, with evangelical and fundamentalist voters. Because these were two groups of voters in the 2016 primary that were very suspicious of Trump. So Trump picked Pence in order to fill that need to shore up his credentials with those voters. Trump doesn't believe he needs that help anymore. So he's not gonna pick an establishment candidate. If he picks a candidate who happens to be more religious, it's not going to be in order to win those voters over, because after three U.S. Supreme Court appointments, he doesn't need help to appeal to religious conservative voters. So unlike 2016, when Trump selected a running mate and a cabinet and a senior White House staff because he felt that's what he needed to govern effectively, eight years later, Donald Trump doesn't believe he needs that help anymore. So you're going to see him make those selections for a running mate and should he win for a cabinet and a White House staff, not based on people who he thinks will give him credibility, but the people who he thinks will do what he wants them to. He feels like a lot of the people he brought into his administration after his election in 2017 were not devoted to his goals and in fact worked to undermine him 
And it wasn't until the end of his four years in office that he put together a team that was going to do the things he wanted to do. If he is elected president later this year, instead of appointing people who may or may not do what he wants, you're going to see him picking loyalists. And when he does pick a running mate, which he has not yet, it's going to be someone who he wants, not someone who he thinks other people might want and who might help him. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And like I said to Anita, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed having you involved in our programs over the last few years. Uh, just like tonight, everybody, uh, Robert always asks really smart and interesting questions. When we gather is a smaller group from 6 to 6.30. And I'm just always happy to see you and always happy to have you involved. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'm you know, really impressed with the World Affairs Council and you, and I'm a very loyal member because of Mostly because of you, but. All right, we now return you to your regularly scheduled webinar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, want to thank Robert and Anita again. And just a reminder that if you're interested in, in being on screen and asking Dan a question during this segment in the future, definitely feel free to reach out to Katie or I. We'll start a list um, and get some more members on screen. So moving into our audience questions submitted in the Q&A box, I want to start with this one. This audience member said, should Trump not be the nominee, would Biden step aside for another Democrat? It's, it's, it's a really interesting question. I think one of the main reasons it gets asked is because Biden theorized about this out loud a few weeks ago. Um, Biden is a fairly unique in, in many ways as a politician, one of which is, is he says what's on his mind whether it's to his political benefit or not. And every once in a while when Joe Biden is thinking out loud, we get some real insight into where his head is. And so when he told a group of donors late last year that if Trump had not run again, had not run again that he, Biden, not, might not have run either, that suggests to me that Biden's primary motivation at this point is not serving a second term as president, but stopping Donald Trump from serving a second term. If Trump were to withdraw or to be defeated, I don't think Biden would step down. But it's pretty clear from what he said to those donors a month or so ago that he believes he is the best positioned Democrat to stop Donald Trump from becoming president again. And that's what's driving him forward more than anything else. Remember that in 2016, Biden referred to himself when he was a candidate as a transitional president one who is going to build bridge from the past to the future. And I think he's ready to bridge to the future. But first he wants to stop Trump. So we've talked to quite a bit about Kamala Harris on previous webinars, but we haven't really touched on her tonight. Uh, this audience member said, will Harris decline to run for vice president to one, allow for someone less unpopular to support Biden and two, to prepare for to run for California governor. Um, I can't imagine the circumstance under which Kamala Harris uh, is replaced on the ticket. Uh, first of all, if you're Harris, being president is a better job than being governor. And if she were to wait to run for president until 2028, uh, there's a potential that she could win national office as opposed to a state office. But there has been a lot of conversation about whether Biden should replace Harris on the ticket because she has relatively low levels of popularity. And I don't think that's going to happen for a couple of reasons. Um, one, the most loyal Democratic pri primary voters for many, many years have been African-American women. And if Harris, a woman of color, were replaced on the ticket, I think given what we were saying earlier about how important it is for Biden to motivate the party's base, I can't think of a better way for him to demotivate his party's most loyal voters than by removing Harris from the ticket. Uh, second, while this is the type of thing that gets speculated about every four years, some of you may remember that when Barack Obama was running for re-election, there was speculation about whether Biden would be replaced on the ticket by Hillary Clinton. But generally, it, it almost never happens. And when it does, it's because there's a division in the party and sends a real message of disarray to voters. 
And it's difficult to see Biden wanting to start such a such confusion and such a sense of disorganization that replacing her on the ticket might. But then finally, and to me, this is the most important of the reasons why I believe Harris will stay on the ticket. We talked earlier about how the abortion issue works so greatly to the Democrats' favor. Biden himself, as most of you know, was pro-life for many years. He's a devout Catholic, and even though he believes that abortion ought to be legal, now, it's never been an issue that he's particularly comfortable with. Of all the different ways to motivate Democratic-based voters in November, abortion rights is probably the most important way to do it. It's not an issue that Joe Biden is particularly comfortable talking about, but it's an issue that Harris, despite some of her other challenges as a candidate, Harris is very enthusiastic and very energized when she talks about this issue. And for the Biden campaign to turn out the voters that we were talking about earlier, you need someone talking about this issue in a very compelling way. And that is something that Harris can do and has begun doing. So turning to the Republican primary again, do you think that the admonition about Donald Trump from the Conservative National Review will have an effect on conservative voters? I don't. And the National Review has been a very respected conservative publication for decades and decades. But it's worth remembering that while the bulk of Trump's support comes from voters who identify as conservatives, it's fairly clear from public opinion research that their primary allegiance, these voters, is not to a particular issue or issue set, but rather to Trump himself. And if a conservative publication that was very prominent for most of the for most of the, for the second half of the 20th century criticizes Trump, there are some older school mainstream Republicans who might be impacted by that. But the overwhelming majority of Trump's base probably doesn't read the National Review doesn't think about it that much. And they're committed to him, not because of Trump's position on an issue that the review might think is important, because, but rather because they believe Trump is willing to fight for them and stand up for them. And so Trump is veered from traditional Republican orthodoxy on any number of issues over the years, on trade, on deficits, on, on many others as well. But his voters, more important than any issue, know that he fights for them. And that's what drives them. And I don't think a publication or a website uh, uh, that that made its bones within the, in the in the conservative movement in the 20th century is going to have much of an impact on that. And if the Republicans block a budget resolution and cause a government shutdown, how might that affect the election, if at all? Well, voters have short memories. So if there's a government shutdown, if the new speaker, Mike Johnson, is not able to fashion a compromise uh, with Senator Schumer in the White House, and that shutdown takes place in January or February, I have to believe that by November, it won't be something that very many voters are thinking about at all. If for some reason that shutdown were to take place over the summer or even in the fall, what we've seen in the past is the congressional majority party takes to take tends to get more blame for those shutdowns than the White House does. And what's interesting is that although Johnston is a new speaker, he seems to understand that. And it's been reported that he's told his own caucus members, even the most conservative members in the Republican House caucus, he says, if there is a government shutdown, we get hurt politically by that. It's difficult to see that shutdown affecting the presidential campaign, but it could be the kind of thing that would cause some damage to Republican House and con congressional candidates around the country. So even there are there, even though there are still a small number of Republican House members who would like to see government shut down if they're not able to achieve their policy goals through budget negotiations, the majority of Republican electeds in Washington and elsewhere think it would work very, very hard to avoid that shutdown because they understand that it could hurt them in congressional races in the fall. 
So turning to a couple of foreign policy questions as we're getting closer to the bottom of the hour, um, will the Israeli-Gaza problem cause a loss in votes on either side and which side will be most affected? Well, that is, that is a, if not the most important, one of the few most important questions in this election. Because three and a half months ago, it's not something that anyone was thinking about. There's never peace in the Middle East. But until October 7th, there was no indication that it was going to become a top-tier issue the way it has since the Hamas attacks uh, in early October. My own opinion, and reasonable people can disagree, uh, is that particularly in the context of the discussion we were having earlier about the importance of Biden motivating the Democratic base, I believe that the war in Gaza has the potential to be of significant harm to Biden. Or as the voters he needs to win most, young people, voters from minority communities, and progressive voters, those are also the voters who are most likely to oppose the very ardently pro-Israel stance that he's taken since the outbreak of hostilities a few months ago. And so for voters who he needs it's not just that they're un it's not just that they're uninspired with what he's done on other issues that are important to them. But a lot of these voters are very angry at the president. And again, as I said earlier, these are voters who would never ever vote for Donald Trump or any other Republican. But if they're sufficiently upset at Biden for the tack that he's taken in the Middle East, that depressed Democratic turnout could have a catastrophic impact on his reelection campaign. And so Biden, not only does he have the challenge of inspiring that base vote, but now he has to do it in the face of a really high profile foreign policy issue that has been symbolic of a much broader set of disagreements uh, between the more establishment wing of the Democratic Party and the more progressive wing. Remember I said earlier that if a party is divided on an issue, that issue usually benefits the opposition. Well, the Democratic Party, much more than Republicans, are divided on issues relating to Israel and the Middle East. And as long as those remain top tier issues, that is a significant challenge and potentially a very difficult challenge for Biden. We also had a question come in, and this is a breaking news story. Um, but this member asked, any comments on the reported attack on the Houthis in Yemen by the U.S. and Great Britain? Does this signal a widening war? It may. And I'll admit, I just saw the headline briefly before we signed on to begin to prepare for tonight's program. Uh, but I think what we can say safely is that the U.S.'s primary goal ever since October 8th, since the day after the original Hamas attack, was to keep this war from spreading. And as we all know, in addition to the hostilities between Gaza and southern Israel, there's been ongoing violence between Hezbollah in Lebanon and the northern part of the state of Israel. We also know that there's been increasing unrest in the West Bank. And we also know that the Houthis out of Yemen have been mounting ex increasingly aggressive strikes on merchant ships uh, sailing through the Strait of Hormuz. Any one of these can broaden with right, right now is a horrible but fairly isolated conflict into a region-wide conflagration. Again, Biden's goal, primary goal from the beginning, even more than stopping the Gaza war, has been to keep it from spreading. And the fact that U.S. and British troops felt it necessary uh, uh, to fire on Houthi pirates today doesn't guarantee that the war is going to spread geographically but it greatly increases that likelihood. So I wanna wrap up with this final question because we were planning to get to it tonight, but this audience member asked, any thoughts on the Supreme Court possibly removing Trump from the presidential ballot because of the 14th Amendment? No, we will talk more about this in the future because this isn't a topic that's gonna to be settled between now and the first week of February when we do our next webinar. But I think all of you know, uh, Trump is facing legal challenges on any number of fronts. 
But I'd say that the two that are most important is number one, uh, the question that's now being heard in relation uh, to Jack Smith's Washington case on whether Donald Trump, whether a president should be immune from prosecution. Uh, that's uh, a case that will almost certainly make its way to the Supreme Court. And the other is the questioner mentioned is what we've now seen in, in Colorado and Maine and elsewhere, states deciding that what they believe was Trump's involvement in insurrection on January 6th, 2021, disqualifies him from the presidency. I think what's important to remember is that John Roberts, sometimes successfully, sometimes not, his greatest priority, it seems to me, ever since becoming Chief Justice, has been to try to establish the court, or I should say reestablish the court, as an honest broker, an, uh, a nonpartisan arbiter. And of course, that in this political climate, that's become very difficult, and he's been somewhat unsuccessful at that. But that's where he likes to go. And while there are th almost always three very loyal votes on the left from Democratic nominees, and while there are almost always three votes on the right, Republican nominees, Roberts, and to somewhat of a lesser extent, uh, Kavanaugh and Barrett, will often help fashion a majority opinion designed to establish the court in that center role. Given that incentive, while nothing's impossible, I suspect given these two critical cases, immunity and ballot access, that the Supreme Court splits the difference. And in both cases say, ultimately voters should be empowered to make a decision, not us. And so again, there's no way to predict what the Supreme Court's going to do, but I think much more likely than not given past statements in past cases is that the court does decide to allow Trump to remain on the ballot, but then also makes it clear that he's not immune from legal and judicial challenge and possibly conviction. In both cases, the common principle being, let the voters decide this. We're not gonna take him off the ballot. We're not going to make him immune from any prosecution. We're going to let the voters make this decision in, in November. So it's entirely possible that by the time we meet again in February or March, Rachel, I'll have been proven wrong on one or two or more of those points. But that's what makes these webinars interesting. We'll hopefully you'll all come back a month later. And if need be, I'll be more than happy to wipe the egg off my face. And I know Rachel will be more than happy to help me. Yeah, so much to cover. I know we'll we'll definitely have a lot of topics to get to in February. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Dan, as always. I mean, your analysis is is just excellent. And we really appreciate the time that you put into the webinar and having you here. So thank you again, uh, Robert and Anita. I also want to extend our thanks to you for being kind of our guinea pigs on this first round of this segment. Uh, you did a great job, so we'll look forward to seeing you again soon, and we'll also look forward to seeing our members shortly for the members only after the webinar session. So if you haven't signed up for that yet, definitely email Katie or I, and we'll get you the link. Um, we also hope to see you at one of our upcoming programs on January 17th, which is next Wednesday. We host General David Petraeus for lunch at the Fair Fairmont Miramar. I think this event is sold out or very close to being sold out. I haven't checked it during the program, but we hope that you were able to snag a ticket and we'll see you there. Um, on January 25th, we host authors Steve Singh and Olivia Chung for a webinar on their new book, The Political Thought of Xi Jinping. And then on February 1st, like Dan mentioned, we'll be back here and answering more of your questions on the monthly Dan Schneer Political Report. So be sure to visit our website and thank you all again. And thank you, Dan, so much. Thank you, Rachel. And thanks to all of you for, be, for, all of you for being with us tonight. As always, we really appreciate it. And we'll look forward to seeing you again in a few weeks.